Um, and lunch. No pressure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we ready to start? Yeah. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Troy Dawson. And Howdy, y'all. My name's Carl George. Uh, I'm the Apple Steering Committee Chair, and... I'm also on the Apple Steering Committee, and I'm also the team lead for the Apple team within the Community Platform Engineering Group at Red Hat. All right, and this is our annual, actually semi-annual, State of Apple, and welcome. Uh, as usual, I'm going to start off with slides. Slides, they're all slides. <laughs> with uh, graphs. These are all thanks to Matt's, you know, Matt showed his Brontosaurus Iser thing. He only showed one slide, but he actually makes hundreds well, hundred of slides, and I grab them from them. Uh, these numbers are based off of Volapteropolis. These numbers are based off of uh, unique IP addresses. Um, so they're not the best thing, but it gives us an overall feel. And for older releases, up to Apple 8, so... Seven is on here, and it's the only one we can use in Apple 8 and 9, and that 10 are actually on here, but we have other charts for them. Uh, these are sort of typical. Seven has been just going crazy, and we see this really fun spike. Let's look at it more in the line thing. That is when Amazon uh, changed their DNS thing. They messed it up. And all of a sudden, we're getting all of Amazon's traffic. And so we have a good idea that Amazon has millions of Apple 7. It's actually probably, what is it, Amazon 2, Amazon 1? Anyway, yes. Amazon Linux has millions of users. So this is our, our graph. Uh, we do have millions of users of Apple. That is wonderful. But what you really want to see is more the Apple 8 and Apple 9. This is using Bronzor Sapphire, which is uh, the, the main one that, that Matt used. Uh, this is using the DNF count me numbers. And it's, uh, it's actually pretty interesting. So in, in Apple 8, we're up in the almost 3 million numbers, which is great. And 9, we are steadily growing. Where is the laser pointer on the this? The red line. Red line. Oh, that line. Mm, it doesn't show up. Yeah, well. So, Apple 9's growing. Apple 8's still growing. Uh, Apple 7. Uh, we're not quite sure what's going on with <laughs> Apple 7. But it should drop off. But we don't yes. know. Apple 7 is end of life, and Apple 8 still didn't pass it before <laughs> Apple 7 went end of life. Yeah. It's, uh, we'll tune in next talk, and we'll see if those numbers drop. I'm betting they're not going to drop very much. That's my bet. Okay. Uh, this is another way of showing that Apple, Apple 9 is overtaking Apple 8 slowly. Okay, so what is this? This is uh, the number of Apple packages. So this is what our crowd really more cares about. What can you do with <laughs> Apple? And the more packages in Apple, the more things you can do. Uh, Apple 7 is right now the leader in that it almost got up to 8,000 packages before end of life. Uh, and Apple 9, as we can see, Apple 9 is that blue graph. It's, it's had the same slope, uh, well, since the beginning. Damn, that's wild. Why is it so different with the blue line and the green line? What happened in between those? Uh, modularity <laughs> and um, Rust. Well, not, not just that, but all, <laughs> if you look at the 7 line, it also kind of teetered off a little uh, more. Uh, a big difference there is that right before we started Apple 9 was when we started uh, my team uh, inside oh, the Community true. Platform Engineering Group. So instead of Apple being, you know, nobody's full-time job, it's everyone's, you know, hobby on the side, we actually were able to focus on a little more and have dedicated resources working on it. And that has paid off, as you can see, in the numbers. That's true. So it also pays off in the... I don't want to go outside the camera because the camera, you know what? Oh, this is your laptop. I'm not going to go poking around on it. <laughs> not that it's a bad laptop. I just don't want to mess it up. Um, if you see on the 8, the, the slope is a little bit big, but 9, the slope is really high, which is yeah. that. I put the, the thing in the wrong spot. 
Well, the big di the other big difference too is we're able to start Apple Nine before Rail Nine actually came out by using CentOS Stream Nine to build against it first. Yep, I'm going to do no no, and since this isn't doing things, I'm going to go over here and point. <laughs> it's not really obvious. Rail Eight is right here, and the graph doesn't even start until a little bit further. Whereas Rail Nine is over here, and that actually starts six months before. Yeah, that's correct. That's what happened. So, and then the. You know, 7.3 teetering off, that's where Rust came in. So, Carl's team, maintainer, and uh, that sort of throws our numbers off. Oh, those years is not right. We're at three years for, for Apple Mine, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Sorry. 2021. Oh, yeah, that should be three years, but sorry about that. Oh, we're at Apple 7. Do you want to take this? Sure, one? sure. So... Uh, Apple 7, um, we recently had a significant event, uh, Apple 7 went end of life because Rail 7 reached its, uh, what we usually call the regular end of life, it's not actually that, it's the end of maintenance support. Uh, there's still additional extended stuff you can buy from Red Hat, but Apple doesn't build against that. We actually talked about possibly doing that. Uh, Troy had the foresight to bring up an issue in the steering committee of, you know, we know people are going to ask for this after we turn it off. Let's talk about it. Is this something we want to do? And, you know, we never built Apple against rail ELS before. Uh, other things we weighed into the decision were that ELS is not included in the free developer subscription. So we, you couldn't build it locally uh, without paying for it or having a comp an employer that paid for it. And as far as we'd heard, uh, there was zero maintainer interest. None of, the, none of the actual Apple maintainers were saying, I really want to keep building these packages against something that was released in 2014. So uh, with all of those factored in, we decided, yes, we're going to go ahead and make the decision now, like I think a year ahead of time. We are, in, we are ending Apple 7 with the Rail 7 regular end of life, the end of maintenance support, just like we always have, nothing different. And that came in handy because we immediate, basically immediately got requests like, oh, how do we keep doing Apple updates? Uh, or, or rather, I want to keep getting Apple updates from a user, consuming them. And we're like, no, you got to get them from the archive now. It's shut down. Here's the previous decision. We act, talked about this in the open. And that's how it's going to be. So that made it a little easier, a little yeah. easier pill to swallow. It wasn't any maintainers saying, oh, I want to rebuild this package. No, it was yeah. users. Well, uh, understandable. Yeah. Next one. Oh, yeah. I'm... Ooh. All right. Here's so one, uh... Apple 8, we've had a few, other, a few events here, too. Um, we have a model called, a thing called Apple Next. Uh, and if you haven't heard of that before, um, it's something I'm going to get into more on the Apple 10 slide. But... Uh, what it is is that in the, in the historical model with Apple 7, we would build that against RHEL, and then people would use it on RHEL and also other distributions like it, like classic CentOS. And sometimes there'd be a problem where there was a difference there, where like say CentOS was rebuilding in a month behind, and then a library changed in RHEL affects an Apple package, and you wouldn't be able to have a build that actually worked for both of them. 99% of the time you would, but then you'd get into a, a weird edge case for like a month where it wouldn't work. And we just kind of ignored it and said, okay, well, it'll resolve itself in a month. It's good enough. CentOS Stream kind of disrupted that. Instead of being like a month behind RHEL, CentOS is now like four to six months ahead of RHEL and was getting these library changes as er early. So we needed a place where maintainers could build against CentOS Stream. But we couldn't just change everything to build against that because then those same builds wouldn't work on RHEL anymore. And that's definitely not acceptable. So what we came up with was an alternate repo, not a complete duplicate Apple, but a separate build route and target so that maintainers could, when, the, when they optionally needed to, do a separate build that built against CentOS Stream. Um, that worked out pretty well as like a bolted on solution. It, let, it solved the problem, maintainers could do the builds they needed, um, but it had a lot of problems, and I'll get into that more later. But uh, the first iteration of that, Apple 8 Next, uh, reached its end of life because CentOS Stream reached its end of life, CentOS Stream 8 reached its end of life. Um, which is the same as the RHEL 8 end of full support phase, timing-wise. Uh, but Apple 8 itself, the main repo building is RHEL 8. That's going to continue through May 2029, which is the, the RHEL 8 regular end of life. Great. Mm -hmm. So Apple 9. This one was really, we talked about a little bit on the stats slide. This was the first one we actually launched ahead of the corresponding RHEL version, like the full launch. Um, we, yeah. <laughs> We originally built it against CentOS Stream 9, which was a, a little bit of a bold thing because Apple Next we were building against CentOS Stream, but regular Apple, we always built it against RHEL. 
But then we said, well, what if we actually, you know, we've been telling people that CentOS Stream represents what's coming in RHEL in the next minor version. So right now it's, you know, 9.0 content. Let's put our money where our mouth is and start building Apple 9 now against CentOS Stream and then use those packages at the RHEL 9 launch. And it worked. Uh, we had, uh, was it like 2,600 source packages? I think like 5,700 RPMs. At, you don't have to go back. I think those are the right numbers. Uh, we had a lot yes. of packages at the RHEL 9.0 launch because we were able to start it early, building against that. And I don't, we are not aware of a single bug that was filed that was caused by, uh, you know, this was built against CentOS and it didn't work on RHEL. So what we thought and what we were telling people this should work, it worked just, as far as we know, there could have been something that nobody filed a bug for. We know that happens, but um, as far as we know, things worked really well. And Apple 9 Next is still, uh, Apple 9 Next continued to build against CentOS Stream where we switched Apple 9 to RHEL 9 at that time, at that launch. So at that point, it mirrored the Apple 8 setup. Um, Apple 9 Next is going to keep going through May 2027, which is the CentOS Stream 9 end of life date and the end of RHEL 9's full support phase. Uh, and of course, Apple 9 itself is going to keep going through May 2032. You ready? Yep. 10. So here's the real interesting one. This is what the crowd is here for. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> we actually started planning this uh, almost two years ago, like a year and eight or nine months ago. So we've been talking about it for a long time, and it's finally starting to happen. Um, spoiler for the Hackfest tomorrow, uh, I actually just did the first two real Apple builds earlier, like in Koji, everything's working. Yes. Yeah. So for the for the Hackfest, it won't be just more infrastructure pieces. P packagers can come to the Hackfest and actually start building their packages. So, um, but let me talk about why that's special and why why we had to start planning it almost two years in advance. Um, well, the big thing we're going to do is we're going to actually have minor versions in Apple for the first time ever. Uh, historically, Apple has always been major version only, uh, and it would just it would still build against the RHEL minor versions, but always the current latest minor version. And when the new minor version of RHEL came out, it just switched over. Just immediately, there was no, no testing or anything on the Apple side. It was just, we switched the build root over, and then if something doesn't work, now, you can, now your builds are broken and you gotta go fix it. Um, or if the install's broken, you have to rebuild against the library or something. Uh, but with Apple 10, we're gonna actually have it where we're gonna treat CentOS Stream 10 as the newest minor version of RHEL 10, because it basically is, especially from a RHEL maintainer's perspective, that's how they look at it in their development. Uh, so CentOS will be the leading minor version, um, and then we'll have minor version branches to actually build against specific RHEL minor versions. Uh, so if you're a Fedora packager, and you've done a build where you build it in Rawhide, and then it, it gets inherited in the next Fedora release, we wanna have a similar model with Apple 10, where you can build it in the Apple 10 branch, It'll build against uh, CentOS Stream 10, and then it'll get inherited into, say, 10.0, and then RHEL users can use it. Uh, or if the maintainer wants to request a separate 10.0 branch, they can do two builds. Just like right now, they could request an Apple Next build and two, do two separate builds, but it's optional. If they just want to keep building it in the leading branch and let it inherit into the next minor versions, which actually works a lot like how RHEL maintainer's workflow works. If it's not a lot of justification to get it into current minor version, they just make the change or the new package in the leading one and let it show up in the next minor version. Uh, will, the, will there be any uh, forward inheritance? Like if, uh, if I wanted to build something for 10.0 specifically because I wanted to make sure that it was built on an old version of a library that I knew that you know, with RHEL policies, it'll, even if they add new stuff, it'll still be compatible forwards. Can I build something on 10.0 and have it uh, assumed to be in Apple 10.1 and 10.2 automatically? Yes, and that is a key thing. In fact, but, well, I was going to say he's actually, if you're at the point where 10 point, are you saying that 10.3 is already out and you yes. want to build it out? If 10.3 is out, you cannot build against 10.0. Currently, right, right. Currently, but I think, I think what he's asking is, do I have to keep building it on each minor version, or is the build I get, did against 10.0 going to still be there in 10.3, right? Uh, no, it's supposed to be. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's, I think we're going to come up with that later in the slides. Yeah. So So that's the high level. Let's do, uh, let's talk about that one. Oh, sorry. Well, it's fine. Um, I'll skip the Apple 7 when it's not important. So for Apple 8 branching, the way it worked, we had 
Epple 8 built against the latest roll, 8 minor, with an EL8 disc tag and the Epple 8 repo path. And there was the Epple next thing that we started where we built against CentOS Stream 8, we changed the disc tag slightly, and then uh, had a different repo path. And again, it wasn't a, a total duplicate Epple, it was just optional, just the builds you need. So CentOS users would use both repos, and rail users would just use the main Epple repo. Um, and that mostly worked. For Apple 9, uh, we have the same setup. Uh, it, the only difference was that at first we had Apple 9 built against CentOS Stream 9, and then we switched it to RHEL once it existed in the public. Mm. But the big difference is uh, what, I was getting, what I thought you were asking about was the build inheritance. With Apple Next, if you fixed a build that changed because of a library change in Apple Next, uh, whenever the same thing happened in RHEL, uh, you had to repeat those builds and do them over again, which I know is especially yeah. painful for Troy with KDE, with yeah. its thousands of packages. Just a, as an example, QT always got updated once a year, and it hit CentOS Stream first, which broke all of the KDE stuff. I'd have to build it in Next, and then when the next release, 9.3, came out, I had to build everything a 9.3 within the... Well, I got pretty good. I can do it in two days. <laughs> um, and get it out, but it's still a pain. Yeah, and so that's I got to thinking about that and thinking that we don't have that in Fedora, right? If QT gets rebased in Rawhide, which is this exact slide we're on right now, uh, you could do all those changes in Rawhide, get it working, and then when Fedora, so in this case, 40 released, all those builds would be inherited because you yep. did them when Rawhide was 40. Yep. And so that that key thing about inheriting the builds is what got my wheels turning about like what? How could we do this more like Fedora? Fedora, I, you know. It's, it's a well-oiled machine in my mind because they're having to do this churn every six months. How can we do things more efficiently and more familiar for Fedora maintainers? Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. So that's what we're going to set up with Apple 10. Um, we're going to have, for example, this would be what it looks like at the RHEL 10.0 launch. We'll have Apple 10 build it against CentOS Stream 10 with a 10.1 disk tag and a 10.1 repo. But then there's also going to be Apple 10.0 branches built against actual RHEL with a 10.0 0 uh, disk tag and a 10.0 repo path. I have a lot more detailed version of this slide that I will use as a visual aid during the Hackfest if you really are curious about how these pieces are interacting together. Um, but I could go on about this for 30 minutes and take up our whole presentation time, so I won't. It's get it, I'm getting more and more, learning more and more of the rail inch pieces of this, and it's been a journey. <laughs> and, uh, that's the reason why we're getting the last pieces together here at the event, and so it'll be successful for the Hackfest. Um, go ahead. Yeah, and speaking of, that is uh, this Friday, tomorrow, uh, in the Azure room. Um, and me, me, Troy, and Stephen Gallagher here in the front row heckling me will uh, we'll be do running that Hackfest. We'll uh, the original submission I put in was we're either going to be working on the infrastructure to make it work, or for far enough along, which we are, uh, we'll act packagers can show up and just start requesting Appleton branches and doing their Appleton builds. Uh, there's still a few infrastructure pieces we can look at and work on if that's where your focus is or interest is. Um, we're also going to have a little bit of a uh, special thing. Uh, Stephen wants to talk about Apple 11. So we're going to carve out like, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes of the Hackfest time and start planning ahead to that about what we can do there. And uh, I know a lot of the conversations around EL and extras and how that works now and how could we do it better. So I am fully in support of questions like, what, what are we doing dumb here? Because that's how, I, how we got to Apple 10 and how we did Apple Next, all of that. Good. Is that the last one? I think so. It goes, goes to me. Uh, this is, how long do we got? We got till one, right? Yeah, you got okay. Then I will talk a little bit about this. Uh, I, I maintain KDE and Apple. Apple, Apple 10, we're going to have KDE 6. We will not have any 5 stuff unless, <laughs> I'll try my best. We will not have any 5 stuff. But we will have QT5. Uh, we will be following Fedora's QT5 plans. We will not be Fedora. I, I had mentioned once I was planning on doing RHEL 9's QT5. That's just really not working on Apple 10. I have tried. But so we'll be doing the shorter Fedora 5, 5 Apple 5. Uh, and this is the overall plans. Apple 8, just major update, or no major updates, just security fixes. Apple 9. <sighs> Apple 9 is going to be a pain for me for a little bit because we've now. Fedora has now moved on, and that means I have to pull in the tire balls. I can do it, but it's not as, not as easy and nice as it used to be. And Apple 10, uh, we will be following Fedora in the QT6 realm. And uh, 
so that's that's our KDE update. You mean you're not giving me Plasma 6 on Apple 9? I am, you know, there's been plenty of people. It says there, Plasma the 6 copper, and yes. copper. Uh, there's, some, there's some problems. So it's mainly with older libraries. Yeah, I've, I've already had people ask for that. And so is that you're having to actually put a few newer libraries in the copper in order to get it to build? I think that's what I'm okay. going to have to do because it's not going to fit in Apple 9. Unless, you know, Rails suddenly changes their policy five years in. I don't think that's <laughs> happening. Go we'll, we'll, we'll worry about it. <laughs> okay. That was it. KD. Hey, we actually have other Apple things that don't deal with packages. Uh, the Apple Steering Committee. Uh, there's several people, seven people on the Apple Steering Committee. This year we had our first official elections. Before it was... It, it, appointments appointments yeah people just sort of randomly got put on and uh we blame jim back there <laughs> <laughs> that's right man jim you you were everywhere at one point um so we had our first official election we held them during the fedora's elections uh both Gore and myself got reelected. um we're doing it half and half just once a year um half the does it one year, the other half does it the other. So three on the committee are still appointed, and then they're going to run in the next election for re-election. I'm assuming all three of them are going to run for re-election. Um, but yeah, the yeah. In, this, in this election we just did, uh, we had one member, uh, Pablo Greco, he stepped down. He didn't want to step down originally, um, but because we, because we didn't have voting and a, a way for him to get back on, but he knew because it was an appointment-based thing, he's like, well, if I step away, I don't know if I'll ever get back on it. Um, and then when we did, we implemented the vote and he's like, okay, I can step back now because I haven't been able to spend as much time on this as I want because I know I can just run in the next election. There's an actual process to do this. So, um, and we, we actually have the person that took a seat, uh, Jonathan Wright, right there in front of Jim too. So he's brand new on the steering committee. So, and, and I like that because it, does, it doesn't put as much pressure on you. I, you know, if you do, if your job changes for a while, you can step away and mm -hmm. come back. So anyway, that's... You know new. we're going to get Smooge back eventually. <laughs> you know what? Smooge has been doing just as much as he used to, even right. though he's not on the committee. <laughs> and he's sort of like uh, Kevin. Well, Kevin's on the committee, but if Kevin says anything, you're like, oh, wait, Kevin said something. Smooge says something. It's like he's, he's got just, the He's just one of those helpful people. He's like the old, old guy on the porch. Oh, <laughs> back in my day. Old, old business in the meeting, right? Yes. <laughs> For those that don't know, that's one of the agenda items is old business, and we always refer to smooge. Wait, are we at questions and answers already? How do we do that? Lunchtime. Hey. <laughs> that's a little early. I told you I don't want to stand between y'all and lunch. You know, oh, you need to ramble more about this. <laughs> I mean, I can. You can well, um, let's let's do, let's do some questions I bet the and Q &A answers. Will get uh, there is some questions and answers. Even I'll be, though I'll be Mike Runner. Okay. Any questions? Oh, I, I I actually have one on Stephen's behalf because we actually didn't get to what I said we were going to get to on Stephen's things. So, so I, I, had did, a I did see three questions. So. so I saw on the uh, on the graphs that Apple Six is somehow still on life support. Like, do we just as a rule not turn it off to encourage the correct behavior, or are we okay with that? It is on the archive, which means the mirror managers don't do it, and um, yeah, people are still doing it. It's very much like CentOS cuts off at the end of a release, but they still have them in vault. Yeah. So we're still measuring the archive and uh, people still use it. Hey, they're yeah. still using five. You, if you look back there, five is still alive. The big difference is we do what Fedora does is with uh, an end of life relief get, gets moved to the archive or the vault. Um, but Fedora does it where mirror manager just gets changed for requests. Instead of pointing to the live path, they point to the archive path just seamlessly. So people don't get that interruption where CentOS moves it all over and then turns off the mirror redirection stuff. Yep. 
I literally recently had a use case for this. I did a fresh install of Rails 6 and updated it and installed stuff from Apple 6 on it, so I'm happy it still works. And it works surprisingly well. You have to fiddle around to make OpenSSL incredibly ancient OpenSSL, oh, except yeah. <laughs> old, except current SSL certificates. But yeah, it did work, so. You started with the do as I, don't do as I do. Oh, <laughs> please don't use Rails 6 or 5 or 4. They're out of life. Three's okay. <laughs> Three's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me uh, talk about Stevens, Stevens things, and because th this was also discussed on the on a committee meeting, and it was that's for future us. Um, let's say we get to to where ten point uh, rail ten point three is out. Uh, you will not be able to build in Apple on RHEL 10.2, 10.1. So that part is currently different than Fedora. Fedora, if you needed to be, build a package on Fedora 38, you, yeah, 39, you still could. But for RHEL, uh, it, it gets cut off by the first one. So you'll be able to build on CentOS Stream. You'll be able to build on the latest RHEL. Um, and the discussion was, and that's why I say for future us, we will figure it out because right now Carl's having a good enough time figuring out how to get the point ones and the point twos and all that. We don't know how we would do 10.1 and 10.0. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. What, what I guess I'm asking is, uh, cause we know that, uh, Rel, uh, that rel at least supports the even numbered uh, point releases for an extended period. I'm wondering if it's going to be possible. Uh, you know, I've, I have a library or I have an application that I build in Apple 10. Dot, uh, uh, Apple 10, and I want to build. Uh, I want to be able to uh, release it so that someone who's uh, on, for, the, on for, the long term on the long term yes. support release could, uh, could use it. Currently, as the way we have the proposal done. Uh, it's only the latest rel and the CentOS stream. But it did come up and we were like, we're going to start with this. And if we find a way to feasibly do it and there's enough, um, I, I, I'm not demand. putting, I, I shouldn't put enough demand. I'm not going to put words in the committee's mouth because the committee might still say no. But we're starting with this. Let's just look at what 10.3 looks like. Okay. Oh, you have 10.3. Well, yes, that's... I diagrammed this all out for the Hackfest to explain it better. Cool. Um, so we'll have, uh, we'll be at a point when RHEL 10.2 releases where if you want to build for RHEL 10.2, you can build in an Apple 10.2 branch that goes to the 10.2 Koji target, Koji tag, disk tag, all that uh, in a 10.2 repo. Uh, the Apple 10 branch builds against CentOS and Apple 10 target, all that, but it has a 10.3 disk tag and 10.3 tags and Bodhi release and all of that. Um, and then at the same time as when RHEL 10.2 comes out, what we're, we expect is that we're going to remove the Koji, the 10.1 Koji target and archive the 10.1 Bodhi release and basically shut down that one. We don't really want to maintain more than two at a time. There'll be a brief window where we do three at a time, uh, which is right here where in this little bit of a window when RHEL 10.1's current, but we know that CentOS 10 can get 10.3 content, and you know what I'm talking about, and Dude. secret, secret schedule things. But during this little brief window, we're going to take a snapshot of CentOS Stream 10 and temporarily build against that for the 10.2 branch right before RHEL 10.2 comes out so we don't accidentally have a build with 10.3 libraries in it. Yep. Uh, so there'll be a very brief window where we have three, three active branches and then we immediately swap to the next rel release, archive the last one, and we're on two releases, which is what we have now with Apple Next. We, we're only asking maintainers to deal with two, two branches at a time. Yep. Does that help make it more clear? Very much. So. Okay. Yep. I, I thought that this slide would, these slides would be way too in-depth for this talk, but hey, if we want to go there for Q&A, that's fine with me. <laughs> yep. Thanks for asking the question, because that's probably one that we'll probably get asked. Afterwards, oh, what about? Very in the weeds on rel and stuff, though. <laughs> yeah. And that's what Monos' question would be, too. No, actually, uh, um, 
do you plan anything specifically for even point releases because they have longer life cycle than I, I didn't quite hear it. Can you repeat it? Uh, the even, the even, are we going to do anything different for the releases that correspond to a rel EUS release, even numbers? Oh, well, that's sort of in line with, with Stevens, and the answer is currently no. If there's enough demand, we'll bring it up to the committee, or people can bring it up to the committee. But the current plan is get this out the door, see if this yeah. works. Um, are you not the bugs? And, and the, dif the difference is, is we would just not turn off that Koji target and Bodhi yeah. release yet. So it's really easy to expand to that if we wanted to support EUS releases, which I'll note EUS is included in the free developer subscription. So oh, is it? Yeah. So it's not like we're we, not like with the uh, the ELS stuff extending Apple Seven. We wouldn't be asking people to build against something that they can't do locally for free. Um, so yeah, I, I, from the start, I thought about EUS and I'm like, it'd be really great if we actively supported EUS better, but let's get this out the door and working and make sure it works first. And then we'll have the conversation of, uh, are maintainers interested in doing this? Um, yep. Yeah. So I, I'm pretty sure as soon as we get this out the door, that's gonna be, at least wait for an EUS release to be out. <laughs> so. Uh, okay, at least wait for rel 10 to be out. <laughs> then, we'll have, then we'll have more bugs fixed. Uh, Any oh. other questions? Well, you've been in the loop on this for a while. So. Early lunch? It could be early lunch if there's more, there's another hand out there. Oh, unfortunately, I don't think uh, us getting out early for lunch puts the food out there early. Yeah, I know yeah. the food isn't out yet. But we can be first in line. Why are you keeping us hungry, Carl? <laughs> uh, this question is probably me being a release engineer, uh, or was a release engineer. Uh, are you planning to rebuild everything whenever there is a new point release, or? No, it all should just move down, okay. meaning, uh, Carl, you, you explained that at least 10 <laughs> times. Uh, yeah, can you go back to the Fedora slide that's in this, temp this uh, slide deck? I Just go backwards. Oh, I, I should. Maybe backwards a couple, because I've got one for each stage of Apple 10. It's not um, wanting to do But basically, that. yeah, with the Fedora mass rebuilds, um, Oh, it is we, don't, going back. we don't think that'll be necessary for Apple 10 just because of the, the stable nature of RHEL and CentOS itself of how things, yes, some things change in minor versions and that's why we need to have, we need, why we needed Apple next, why we need, why it makes sense to do minor versions, but it's not like the whole OS. It's not, uh, it's not like a Fedora major version with the amount of changes. It's there way more oh. static. Why is it so slow? There we go. Yeah. So yeah, like the Fedora branching model is very similar, uh, but the thing that we we won't do that we won't follow suit with is doing a mass rebuild uh, after the branches are created. So, like in this model with Fedora, they will uh, mass branching event to do all create all the F40 branches or what we're about to do to create all the F41 branches, and then a mass rebuild of all of those to make sure that all of the builds work. It goes the other way around, Carl. There's it's, it's the other way around. We do the mass rebuild right before branch. So we've done the 41 mass rebuild, and next right. we will do the 41 branch. Yeah. yeah. Had the order wrong. But yeah, the mass rebuild first, and then the mass branching. Uh, but either way, we don't think we need to do mass rebuilds for the Apple 10 minor versions. We think that'll work just well. Um, there will be an occasional thing where, like, oh, yes, this library did change in RHEL. It's coming in the next RHEL minor version. We see it in CentOS Stream 10 now. Um, and, the, and the Apple maintainer has to do a rebuild. That happens now with regular Apple. It's just we're going to disconnect it from uh, having to do it twice to just do it in the leading branch and then it's inherited in the next minor version. On that, what could we do to get a notice when there is an impending failure from one of those changes? Um, so recently, there was a so name change in a nine update. So it would have been one of those rare cases where, yeah, the package had to be rebuilt because it was just non-functional. In Fedora, we get, you know, failure to build or failure to install or whatever. What could we do to, if we're not doing a mass rebuild, how do we get 
some heads up on that on the Apple side? So I like that question. I wrote my will it install script as a hack. I would love for somebody to put up another issue and maybe one of the council members, hey, Jonathan, um, <laughs> write, something, write something that will actually do those notifications because mine was crud. Let's just yeah, face I it. I think that the, uh, in, looking at what Fedora does for the fail to install tickets and that tracking, yeah. that would be really good to adapt that probably with some lessons learned from Troy's Willet scripts and make that work for Apple. And so that way, yeah. that way you would get a ticket file that, hey, your package doesn't install anymore on CentOS Stream 10. And you can yeah. say, oh, if I don't fix it now, it's going to stop installing on all my Linux in six months. Yeah. 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 Yep. So yeah, there's a few things you could kind of adopt to do that from Fedora land. Um, there is the Fedora CI installability test, which kind of tests whether any given new package build is installable or not. It has a lot of problems, but CentOS, you have a small, uh, EPL, you have smaller package sets somewhat, so that may help. I believe the fail to build, fail to install tickets, uh, maybe fail, some, some of them are filed by Koshe. Um, which is constantly trying to rebuild things in Fedora, so you might want to deploy that and then have that that would notice and be like, oh, hey, this package stopped building, file an issue. So there are definitely things you can take that we have already. So it's, it's actually possible. So when I first looked at this, when I first wrote my hack script, um, that was before RHEL. Boy, it's, I'm dating myself, aren't I? That was before there was the free RHEL, and it was before we had CentOS Stream. Um, so I, that was the problem. Why I couldn't put it, put it into the Fedora infrastructure is because I had nothing to test against. It was actually testing against Alma. We've had that issue, actually, the installability checks. Um, they, uh, as far as I know right now, Testing Farm doesn't actually have access to RHEL, and so a lot of the Apple installability, last I heard, that's why they don't have it, the installability checks turned on for Apple packages. They wanted to turn it on with CentOS Stream, and I'm like, well, that'll usually work, except the times it doesn't, and then you're going to get false negatives or positives. But but you would catch the the problems that Jonathan was talking about. Oh. Okay. Why don't they have access to RHEL? That would be a question for that team. I don't know. So, like I said, this was this was many <laughs> years ago question. before the free things, <laughs> and the 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 thing the the repo that Apple builds against is very locked down. And there was no way for, for my, the scripts in Fedora to, to touch that repo. Let, let's talk more about that, Mike. I don't want to out anyone, but I need to tell you about some issues. <laughs> so I, I tend to forget that Koshe even exists. Could we look at maybe enabling it by default for Apple 10 packages as part of this? Because didn't Fedora recently turn it on across the board? So as part of this new model for Apple, could we default it on for Apple 10 packages and it would, it would catch the problems? I, who who I do we have to ask for that? Kevin? I, I, Here's what I think. I think we need to have a, uh, an Apple steering committee member, uh, maybe one that just got elected, uh, lead this initiative and drive this change and figure out who to ask about that. <laughs> I'm going to pull you under the bus with me. Yeah. But, it's a very, very good question, very good, good thing. Um, and I love you asking those questions. Just be willing to also help out with them. Um, that wasn't part of the deal. <laughs> <laughs> just, to, just, just to answer the questions about the Cochet, uh, there are new uh, initiative or new federal infrastructure projects that uh, people from Fedora or whatever could uh, actually uh, request a fed in Fedora infrastructure to work on something, if it's bigger thing. If it's something small, uh, just file a ticket in Fedora infrastructure Apple. So, and I, I'm not sure in I like Koshe for Apple 10, how much work it will be, but if it's uh, it shouldn't be that, that it, difficult. It, it's still in Apple 8 and Apple 9, or at least Apple 9. Oh, OK. It has 8 and 9. 8 and 9? Yeah, so. So it's. No, 10's not out yet. So, I mean, Carl literally just built the first package, so. <laughs> OK, so yeah, that was for me. <laughs> but that's, that's great. If Cachet can do that, oh, 
Yeah, that would be great. I would love Does that. anyone know the proper pronunciation of the I thing we're making? No I have no idea. Kosheshi? I hope people online know what we're talking about, but uh, I know what we're talking about, but I don't have any idea how to pronounce it. Any other questions? Yeah. So oh, you sorry. talked about the higher velocity with Apple 9 since you were able to get ahead of REL, um, and of course we set aside uh, time of uh, engineers to work on it. What were the biggest wins? Was it just getting approvals to get things through? Was it maybe internal escalations to get things you know, adjusted if maybe there's a library incompatibility in RHEL? Um, are, are there just more owners? Are there people that just spend their days doing the build? I'm just kind of curious where it would help with that big spike. So I mentioned the CPE Apple team and having dedicated resource, resources for it. Uh, the team started with just me. Uh, we've grown to I say two and a half now. We have three people technically, but one's temporarily on loan from another sub-team inside CPE. Um, but our jo obviously, our job to just crank out packages would not scale. That would not make sense to just have two or three people just building as many packages as possible. So the idea that I went into with it was, how do we maximize our effort and our time to enable the Apple community to build as much as they can? And for Nine, the obvious thing was, Let's start it sooner and just give people more time to work on their stuff, and that's had a huge effect on it. Um, so I, I just want to add to that one, and I'm putting my <laughs> hat jokes, my smooch hat on. Um, hey, this I don't know if he'd wear this or not. Um, Apple Apple Eight <laughs> was back when the CPE team had other things they were doing. They were doing Fedora and all this stuff. And there was literally nobody to set up the Apple 8 infrastructure. And if you, you saw that big gap there, that was, hey, nobody's here to work on it. Also, yeah. modularity is hard. Oh, that was modularity. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Carl, I'll give you the full history. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, as we were preparing for, uh, for RHEL 8, I had the privilege of being sent around to do focus groups. I was literally the guy behind the mirror and had a little jar of M&Ms. They were like <laughs> asking questions about stuff. And in uh, uh, one of the focus groups, it was the whole swath, rel users, non-rel users, all over the place. And we, get a, we got a group of rel users and they just asked everybody, was like, do you consider Apple basically required for rel? And it was, pre it was pretty universal, yes. And that was the, that was the the click for me and then the, the others in the view is like, oh, this is a required thing for us. And so put some money into it and it's worked out pretty well, I think. I've been, I've been happy. So that was happening during the rail thing. So that was after rail eight had already re released? Yeah. Okay, so that's, that explains why we didn't have any people during the Apple eight. Or, yeah, cause, no, yeah. yeah. I'm definitely a fan, seeing as that's my job. <laughs> so. Yep. And what's really funny, and I've got both of you all in the room now, is that when Mike first asked me if I wanted to start this team, I said, that's really funny because I always told Jim, when are you going to hire me to work on Apple? And he said, nobody gets paid to work on Apple. <laughs> <laughs> I proved you wrong. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, for being a liar. It is, it is worth his salary just to make you wrong. <laughs> 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 for those of those... Mike said, it's worth your salary. This is for the online. It's worth your salary just to make you wrong, Jim. <laughs> Hi, uh, Michelle here. I'm, I'm in the Apple uh, Sering Committee as well. Um, to add to the answer to the question, like, um, I, I feel that, well, um, in my day job, like, uh, we, we use Apple a lot, and, like, um, and we needed to get Apple 9 because we aggressively moved to a new CentOS uh, versions. And one of the things that like, uh, made it easier for 9 is that we now have an SIG for people who are interested in packaging that we are gradually adding to packages. And we also have a new process for saying, like, if you are blocked um, uh, trying to get a package into Apple because the maintainer does not respond, now we have an escalation path that makes it, you can get any package within three weeks maximum. Yeah, yeah that's a great point that we, that uh, speaking of things to help get Apple 9 uh, going faster, uh, it's called the stalled, stalled package process. Um, <coughs> And he, he, mentioned, he mentioned it, but in more depth a little bit, uh, you can ask for an Apple package, like if, say it's a dependency block, you're adding your own package, and after, I think it's after the first week, you do another comment, and then after two weeks after that, you can file a rail bug and say, this maintain, maintainer's not responsive, 
Um, we always had the non-responsive maintainer process in Fedora, but that's a really big hammer because that is like orphaning all of a packager's packages and then they're either orphaned or you take them all. And that's too big a hammer for just, I need this one library and you're busy. So we've got it now where you, can, you have a, a less severe escalation path to get yourself added as a co-maintainer and it's restricted to just the Apple branch. So that doesn't even get you access to the Fedora branches. You get the uh, collaborator permission on Apple branches, which is a more recent improvement on Pagger anyways. Um, and so yeah, you can get that build done and it works out pretty well. It's helped, you said it helped, helped y'all a lot get a lot of the packages you needed done. Yep. Jonathan has one, then I have a question. Well, I have a comment. You're the speaker. I'm the speaker. <laughs> Okay, you're the, um, you're the answer, Troy, not the so, question. So just for this is for the the general audience, including those asking. We're we're sort of teasing Jonathan when he's he's the recently elected to the committee member, saying, "Hey, you can work on it too." But the honest truth is, you don't even have to be a committee member. You, whoever you are, can work on things. That's actually how most of these committee members came to be. It they started working on things. And then, you know, in the old days, that's how you got appointed. You were doing stuff, and then you got appointed. So don't think you have to be on the committee to work on Apple. Don't think, well, you do need to be a Fedora packager to do a Fedora maintainer. But there's lots of things you can do for Apple without being on the committee. Um, it's not an exclusive group. Just because, did anything change for you, Jonathan, when you got on the committee, other than you can now <laughs> vote on policies? That's about it. You can vote on policies, um, but the workload probably didn't change. So No, not a bit. So uh, my thing is not so much a question for, for either of you, um, but to build on what Michelle said, and I mentioned this to Carl the other day, actually, um, especially when bootstrapping new versions of, of Apple, you know, the upcoming Apple 10, something that we're going to run into a lot is big spider webs of dependencies with maintainers that won't reply. So if we're constantly having to do, you know, stalled Apple requests or, you know, things of that nature, it's going to take a lot of time to get some things up and running. So should we look at doing something similar to how proven packagers work, but for Apple where we could have certain people that can basically help solve those dependency spider webs and get things that, you know, currently just, they literally just need to be branched and built you know, people with permissions to be able to do that kind of across the board to help with that bootstrapping phase of, of getting a new Apple version off the ground without, you know, having every package waiting on, uh, you know, non-responsive Apple maintainers. So I think we really need Smooch gonna... here to answer that. <laughs> yeah, because, I was going to say. Because uh, for Apple 8, with the modularity problems and everything else, Smooge did a lot just of what you're describing of just, I've got to get this working, I've got to get this out the door, we're months behind, and as a proven packager and probably sysadmin, main, whatever, god mode and in, infrared in he sure. got a lot of stuff built and put it in there, and later exactly. he's like, I should not have done that. Um, yeah, I was going to say. That results in a lot of packages in Apple that are completely unmaintained, and the Fedora packager doesn't know about them, doesn't pay attention to them. So, yes, you want to add packages and get them blocked, but there's, you can't just go full throttle and just throw everything in there. Yeah, um, I, I did that for Apple 8, and uh, yeah, Smooch did it too, uh, before they put the block on. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and Smooch will tell you, learn from my mistakes. Yes, yeah, <laughs> it, it, we've been there, done that, and yeah, unmaintained packages. And I'll even say that with the Apple st the stall package request thing, uh, when we started that, it was just a two week period. And like one of the first times it went through and somebody got permissions for it, the, maintain, the main maintainer complained. He's like, oh, I just didn't get to this fast enough. And we're like, okay, we want this process, but maybe two weeks is too fast. So we slowed it down to three weeks as like, okay, let's just tap the brakes a little bit. And we haven't had any more complaints. Maybe two weeks is fine and we should go back to that. Maybe three weeks is where we want to stay. If we had more complaints, I would say we should slow it down more, but I think three weeks is probably a good st stable spot for that. So, so just a, another example. Um, the, yes, for RHEL 9, I, I do the KDE stack. There's a lot of dependencies on the KDE stacks. So when you're filing those, do find all your dependencies. File them all at once, and you can get them done in three weeks. Plus, now with Apple 10, I'm co-maintainer on all those packages. So that the next time, I'm just going to file them all. Not file them all, branch them all, because I'm now co-maintainer. So it's, it's... And be the Bugzilla assignee, too. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 
that's sort of the benefit of that bug in that uh, I don't get any of the bugs. <laughs> So some of the maintainers do get upset with me. Why aren't you taking this bug? Yeah, and I guess I'll also add, we have the idea that when we keep doing Apple 10, Apple 11, we've already done this once, so we don't have to do it again. And also, there's been work uh, to kind of automate this process. You know, Pagger for the Relens tracker has an API, and Bugzilla, where the package requests are filed, has an API. So if you write a script and checks the dates, and if it's been however many, you know, files or requests, you know, it at least makes it a little less tedious than having to do that a hundred times by hand. I think the key thing is I need to stop changing things between Apple versions. <laughs> But I've got this like problem in my brain where I say like, why aren't we doing this better? So um, I think Apple 10 is the best thing I can come up with with the everything else the same. So I don't see any reason. Well, I say I don't see any reason we do Apple 11 differently, but Steven's got ideas about that. Uh, so we'll talk about that at the Hackfest. <laughs> but his ideas are before we're ever doing branches. So like the EL and extra stuff. And it, there's a lot longer conversation. He can speak to it a lot better than I can if he wants to. I think we're at a, close to out of time. We're, we're close to out of time. Yeah, we, but yeah we've that's, that's a bigger conversation. But after the branching, it's, I don't see any reason why Apple 11 would work any different than what I showed with Apple 10. So we should have a little stability there. And because of a lot of it is inheriting and looking at how Fedora does things for their real engine, we should be able to inherit a lot of the stuff. Like when we start looking at the mass branching, I'm going to take the Fedora mass branching script and say like, okay, which parts don't apply to us? What do I need to adapt? And so we have a good starting point for that to reuse some of that automation. Well, I guess not me anymore because I'm not part of the committee. But uh, did uh, you all ever decide to like do the whole automatic Apple branching thing, or did that never happen? Like things that have been branched in the past, branch them again. So I've talked about the mass branching stuff, and I think that's not what you mean by automatic branching. I think you're talking about the idea of you can somehow opt in, and before we ever start Apple 10, have your Apple 10 branch created ahead of time. Yeah. Um, that discussion never went anywhere. It's still an idea that how could a maintainer right now say, uh, I, whenever you're starting Apple, always create the Apple branch in this package because I'm going to put it in there if I can. And if I can't, I'll just retire it and deal with it later. Uh, that's still an idea that's out there. That's an area for improvement in Apple, but nobody's worked on it specifically. Um, that's, that'll factor into some of the content resolver stuff with Apple 11 that Steven will want to talk about at the Hackfest. Yeah. I, it's still who, a good idea. <laughs> as somebody who requests hundreds of branches at a time, it's just a script. I think the big... It's just the four... At the time we were talking about that, the branch <laughs> requests were processed manually by Relinj, so you had to request it and wait. Then we got the SCM toddler to just fire off and do the branches if it met all the criteria. And once the branches, you know, you would get a branch in, you know, two minutes instead of, you know, two days, yeah. nobody cared about that anymore. <laughs> sure, the exception's a little hairier, but that, it, yeah, yeah, it's if, an exception. If you own the branch or co maintainer, you can do it. Carl, I think our time is up. Get back here so that the camera can see your wonderful face. <laughs> Who are you talking about? <laughs> Thank you for facing it away. <laughs> um, our time is up, right? I only if people want to eat lunch. Our time is up, Bye. it sounds like. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Oh, appreciate your time and your questions, and uh, hope to see you at the Hackfest.